So how is Bitcoin different? Well, it's a, it's a completely a virtual currency. It has zero intrinsic value, so it's not like gold or salt or stuff like that. It has no, it's not like you could, if you were stranded on a, an island and you had some Bitcoins in your pocket, I mean, you're gonna starve, okay? <laughs> Mind you, if you're uh, stranded on an island with a block of gold, you're probably gonna starve too, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know. It has no legal backing, uh, so it's not legal tender. Um, the second main property is remarkable, in my view, it's the complete absence of any central authority. There's no central bank to manage the money supply. There's no select intermediaries you go to to process payments. And the hope of this program is twofold. One, it's the hope to, you know, basically slay the inflation dragon that occasionally afflicts centrally, you know, banks with, uh, countries with central banks. The goal is to achieve some semblance of long-run price level stability. And two, to drive transactions costs down to basically zero. So that, like I said before, one day sending money to anyone in the globe would be as simple and as costless as sending an email. Okay, so that's the vision. Let me describe now a little bit about the nuts and bolts about how Bitcoin works, or at least how I understand it works. The first thing you do is you go to the internet and you download this computer wallet, and it's free. Okay, you get a, an associated application that manages the wallet. This wallet is an encrypted computer file where your Bitcoins are stored. This wallet can live in almost any physical device. It could live in your computer. It could live on your USB drive. Some people have taken Bitcoins and embedded them in, in, in real physical coins. And, and some people have gone so far as to embed the Bitcoins in paper, ironically. <laughs> so, okay, so any physical device. Your identity is disguised, okay? So in that sense, it's like having some sort of post office box. And something that's important, the content of every wallet is publicly observable. Now that sounds weird, but that's what is true. So even though your wallet, the identity of your wallet is not known, you know, think of your wallet as a post office box with a slot where people can put money in, but you only, have, you, only you have the key that you can take money out, uh, but it's kind of transparent. Everybody can see how much money is in it. And, you know, people could potentially own multiple wallets. There's nothing to prevent you from, from creating hundreds of wallets if you wanted to. Security concerns. You know, your Bitcoins are subject to loss or theft, just like cash. And this is a, a serious concern for ri rich wallets. So by rich wallets, I mean, you know, imagine carrying around, uh, I don't know, whatever, what do you consider rich? $10,000 or $100,000, some people, maybe a million dollars in Bitcoins on their USB drive. You're walking around, you know, there's no insurance. <laughs> it's, what if you lo lost your USB drive, what would you do? I mean, if the security key was in there with the USB drive, the person who found it could use your wallet and spend it. Uh, if the security key wasn't there uh, and you lose it, or suppose you die and it just kind of is laying around in your desk and your, uh, your kids can't find the key, uh, I mean, that wallet, that money's gone. It'll never be used. What are some solutions that are used out there to uh, kind of uh, circumvent this problem? Ironically, it's the, the solution is to uh, use some trusted intermediaries. So a very popular uh, service is this company called Coinbase. Probably most of us, if we wanted to uh, exchange, uh, uh, use um, Bitcoin as currency, we'd likely go and open an account at Coinbase. And what they do is open an account for you and they manage your wallet for you. And it's just like online banking. And you see they'll keep a record of all your transactions uh, and, um, and except that the expenditures will be denoted in bitcoins. They'll charge you a service fee, of course. It's not insured. I don't think FDIC covers this, does it, Julian? No, so, okay. Um, another service for really big wallets, like this is the guys with like $8 million, $10 million, is that they'll, this elliptic vault will store, will place your USB drive in cold storage, or just take it offline and like stuff it in a vault. And evidently, Lloyds of London is willing to insure these things. So, Again, uh, you know, you have to pay the storage costs, you have to pay the, the costs of the intermediation service, you have to trust the intermediary. I find that a little ironic, right? If you think about that the whole endeavor was motivated 
by the desire to circumvent the need of trusted parties like third party intermediaries. And yet, I think that if this, this program ever gets off the floor, third parties are going to be involved. Just be, it's just something that seems to be unavoidable. Let me describe something that's very important. It sounds crazy, but it's very important. It's called the blockchain. What is the blockchain? The blockchain is a public ledger containing the historical record of all Bitcoin transactions from the beginning of time, which is 2009. It's this huge transaction history. It doesn't record the items that are purchased or sold, right? It doesn't include the identities of the transactors, but what it is, it's like this huge public database living out there, and you can see the movement of every Bitcoin ever created and how it moves from wallet to wallet from the beginning of time. That's called the blockchain, and it's absolutely critical, the role that it plays in this system. It lives in a global network of computers around the world. Anybody who has a Bitcoin account, right, will have access to this public ledger on their personal device. It's a community, communally shared record of which wallets own which Bitcoins. For the system to work, participants must trust the integrity of the blockchain. It's absolutely critical. The power to alter or fabricate the history of transactions is the power to steal. Did your phone just go off? That's what happens with my kids all the time. <laughs> okay, so from the perspective of just the retail user like you or me, if we were to actually uh, use Bitcoin, it'd be very much like just doing online banking. What's different is that there is no single agent at the other end or a bank to process the payment. So, I mean, how does the payment get processed? Well, that's where these miners come in, these so-called miners. The record keeping, that is to say how wallets are debited and credited, is performed by you know, volunteers, I'll put that in quotes, I'll describe it a little more in, in a bit. These volunteers are drawn from the community, they're called miners. The miners must reach consensus. Pending transactions are cleared and added to the blockchain only after, well not quite, but sort of some sort of majority vote approves them. Okay, so it's like a communal thumbs up. You send out your request, you broadcast your request, I wish to send my Bitcoin from this wallet and I want to send it to that wallet. That request is broadcast to the community, the miners kind of mull it over and they either go a thumbs up or thumbs down. If it's thumbs up, they take that, they execute the, the payment, they add it to the blockchain and that's how it works. And, and that's how the blockchain just evolves over time. I thought it was interesting, actually, this, this Bitcoin idea of communal record keeping sounds like this amazing innovation, but uh, in fact, it made me, uh, made me think about uh, something that's actually very ancient. It's a very ancient sort of idea, this idea of communal record keeping of public data, of a public data bank of virtual credits. I mean, you know, if you, from my reading, you know, of, of very primitive economies, uh, think of, uh, uh, you know, old hunter-gatherer societies, right? You'd have the, uh, a hunting party would go out and they'd go to try to bag a, a, a stag or something. And, you know, some members of the party are more skilled than others. Uh, some members are willing to work harder than others. Uh, but, you know, they go out, somebody bags the stag, and what? What happens? Everybody knows. Everybody knows. Oops. Everybody knows who, who, who made the kill. And this becomes part of the communal data bank in everybody's mind. It's like this communal file and sharing program, right? And so, uh, and, and you know, the successful hunter comes back to the village and uh, he draws on that credit, right? I mean, the villagers know who's, bacon the, who's bringing home the bacon, so to speak. Maybe he gets the prime cut. Maybe he gets his, uh, you know, an extra service. He gets his, his, his uh, house cleaned. I mean, he gets stuff done. It's a sen in a sense, he's using his virtual credit to purchase goods and services from his community members. So this idea is, in fact, very ancient, I think. And in that sense, this, this virtual currency idea is drawing on something very fundamental and very primitive. Only, it's extending it to the entire world. It's making it like a, a global phenomenon instead of, in the past, these local communities. 
The most critical and difficult to understand part of the Bitcoin protocol, in my view at least, is, is how it prevents the miners from exploiting the system. I mean, if the, if the miners could be trusted to do the record keeping, I mean, it's a no-brainer. But of course, the whole protocol is built on the premise that you can't trust anyone. I mean, these miners are just regular folk. Uh, they have no history, they have no reputations, they're just anonymous users, right? We have to, built within the, the program has to be a set of incentives that, that makes the miners do the right thing. Exactly how that works, Maybe somebody can explain it to me, but I think you need three PhDs. One in computing science, one in cryptology, and possibly even one in game theory to understand how potentially people would game the system. I mean, really to have a deep understanding of how that works. Now that we're on miners, I want to uh, uh, just uh, take a little sidestep here and just describe this mining uh, thing here a little more. I mean, I think the the word mining is a little bit uh, misfortunate, uh, unfortunate. I don't, I don't know where it came from, but, uh, well, I guess I do, but it's a misleading analogy. And we think of, you know, the, the fellow up there, he's got his mining cap on. Hey, you're mining, you're mining for bitcoins. You're like, right? Well, not really. I mean, think about real gold miners, real miners, gold miners. What are they producing? Gold miners are rewarded for producing gold. Right? You'd think that then, well, therefore, Bitcoin miners must be rewarded for producing Bitcoins. No, that's not true. Bitcoin miners are not rewarded for producing Bitcoins. They are rewarded for their record-keeping services. They just happen to get paid, in part, with newly created Bitcoins. But they could be paid anyway. I mean, for example, gold miners often get paid in US dollars, right? Gold miners don't necessarily get paid in gold. So Bitcoin miners get paid for the services, the record, the, the auditing or bookkeeping or record keeping services, however you want to call it. They get paid partly in newly created Bitcoins, what economists call seniorage revenue. But they also get paid in part with service fees. So if I'm a transactor, for example, I could offer uh, the miners a, a little bit of a fee to kind of speed up, process my payment a little more quickly. So the whole system could, in principle, function completely on this fee these fees. The upshot is that the, that the Bitcoin can function with, with even a constant money supply. You know this, these graphs you see of the supply of Bitcoin growing and then being capped at 21 million? That's just a red herring. You don't even worry about that for how the protocol functions. 